Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous supporters. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation at aaronv.com, A-A-R-O-N-V dot com, making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida. And by rosaryarmy.com. Have more peace. Visit rosaryarmy.com and get an all-twine knotted rosary, downloadable audio rosaries, and more. Make them, pray them, give them away at rosaryarmy.com. You're listening to episode 156 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking with former U.S. military psychic spy, Paul Smith. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. In 1983, a young Army officer named Paul H. Smith received a surprising offer. He was asked if he would be willing to become a psychic spy for the U.S. military. Soon, he was being trained in the discipline of remote viewing by famed psychic Ingo Swan. And then he put the new psychic skill to work doing secret intelligence jobs as part of the project eventually known as Stargate. So who is Paul H. Smith? What is remote viewing? And what happened with Project Stargate? Paul Smith was very generous with his time and gave us enough material for two episodes of Mysterious World. So today we'll hear part one of the interview, which takes us inside the Stargate Psychic Spying Program. Next episode, we'll hear about what led to the program's cancellation in 1984 and then how it was brought back from cancellation at the last minute. We'll also hear more about its history, including Paul's most famous remote viewing hit, and Paul and I will be analyzing remote viewing from the faith and reason perspectives. You're listening to episode 157 of Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking with former U.S. military psychic spy Paul Smith and analyzing remote viewing. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. In 1984, the government's psychic spying program was officially canceled, and it looked like Paul Smith would be reassigned to less interesting duties. But the program that would eventually become Stargate was brought back from the brink of cancellation, and Smith would go on to have his biggest psychic hit ever. In subsequent years, he's had the chance to reflect on the difficulties that exist for using remote viewing to view anomaly targets like Bigfoot, aliens, and the Loch Ness Monster. He's also had a chance to consider how remote viewing compares to practices like mediumship or channeling. And he's been able to think it through from the perspective of faith. So how was Stargate revived? What happened afterward? And how can we analyze remote viewing from the perspectives of faith and reason? That's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World. Jimmy, before we begin part two of our interview with Paul Smith, what do we need to know, especially for listeners who may not have heard part one? One thing people will want to know, if they don't already, is what remote viewing is. It's reported to be a psychic ability that lets people pick up sensory information about distant targets. In the 1970s and 80s, a natural remote viewer named Ingo Swan, together with a scientist named Hal Putoff, developed a methodology for using remote viewing known as CRV, which stands either for coordinate remote viewing or controlled remote viewing. It uses a series of stages to control the flow of information and boost its accuracy rate. The U.S. military and intelligence agencies then started to train people in CRV and had them use it to undertake a variety of intelligence missions such as viewing Soviet bases, Chinese nuclear tests, finding people that terrorists had taken hostage, and intercepting drug traffickers. They did this as part of the program that eventually became known as Stargate. Jimmy, what does the evidence say about whether remote viewing works? 
This is a controversial issue, and there are people who are convinced that it works, as well as skeptics who are convinced that it doesn't. As we heard last episode, in 1995, the CIA commissioned a study of some of the Stargate results. The study was headed by two individuals, Dr. Jessica Utz, a respected statistician, and Dr. Ray Hyman, a psychologist and skeptic. In their conclusions to the study, Dr. Utz said that the statistical support for remote viewing is way beyond what you would expect by chance, and this is a real phenomenon. By contrast, Dr. Hyman, the skeptic, agreed that the results were beyond chance and said that although he wasn't convinced it was a real psychic ability, it still warranted further study. I'll let listeners make up their own minds about what they think about remote viewing. In this episode, to keep the conversation focused on the Stargate program itself, we won't be debating whether remote viewing produces better than chance results or whether psychic powers really exist. That's something you can accept, like Jessica Utz, or challenge, like Ray Hyman. Our task here isn't to settle that question, so you can decide what you think. Instead, our task is to go inside the Stargate program, learn what happened, and ask what it would mean from the faith and reason perspectives if remote viewing works as claimed. One of the concepts that gets mentioned in this episode is out-of-body experiences. Are those the same thing as remote viewing? No. Out-of-body experiences are supposed to be occasions when a person's viewpoint shifts away from their body and they start seeing and experiencing things in other locations. For example, uh, people who are having near-death experiences often feel like they're floating above their bodies and they can see themselves from above and move their viewpoint to other locations. But you don't have to die to have an OBE, or out-of-body experience. There are techniques that reportedly let you have them even without being in danger of death. And the Monroe Institute in Virginia is famous for trying to find ways to do this, especially by listening to certain kinds of audio tracks while meditating. We'll be discussing out-of-body experiences in a future episode, but they're not identical with remote viewing, where a person picks up sensory information about a distant target but does not feel like they're leaving their body. We also mention a few people in this episode, like Ed Dames, Charlene Cavanaugh, and Annie Jacobson. Who are they? Ed Dames and uh, Charlene Cavanaugh were colleagues of Paul Smith, who both served in the Stargate program. Uh, together with Paul and a gentleman named Bill Ray, they were trained in CRV by Ingo Swan, that controlled remote viewing methodology. Annie Jacobson is an author who writes about mysterious subjects, and I really appreciate her books. In this episode, we'll mention a book that she wrote called Phenomena, which deals with the Stargate program as well as other government research into psychic phenomena, both here in the United States and in the Soviet Union and in China. Is there anything else we should say before we hear part two of our discussion with Paul Smith? Yeah, uh, in both the last episode and in this one, uh, listeners of Mysterious World have an unusual opportunity. Most people consume the program by audio only, which is normally what we can offer since StarQuest budget doesn't yet allow for regular video editing. But I conducted the interview with Paul Smith by video, and then Dom and I recorded the opening and closing segments by video. So if you want to see these episodes in video with moving images of Paul and me and Dom, uh, you can watch them online at youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken. That's youtube.com slash Jimmy, J-I-M-M-Y, Aiken, A-K-I-N as in Nancy. We'll also have a link to my YouTube channel in the further resources in the show notes. Before we hear the interview, let's say a word of thanks to our patrons. We like to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including this week Christopher K., Ira R., Martin G., Tim W., and Janelyn M. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation at aaronv.com, A-A-R-O-N-V.com, making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida. And by rosaryarmy.com. Have more peace. Visit rosaryarmy.com and get a free all-twine knotted rosary Downloadable audio rosaries and more. 
Make them, pray them, give them away at rosaryarmy.com. And so, without further ado, let's go into the second part of my interview with Paul Smith. So we've got uh, Center Lane going on with a, you know, mixed success. Some of it's successful, some of it's not. And then we hit a period where the supervisor sees a sign that says, Center Lane closed ahead. In, yes. uh, in, on Friday the 13th, in July of 1984, y'all got word that the program had been closed. Yes. Can you tell us that story? You want the whole story? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have to go back a little bit. So the, the remote viewing program at the time Center Lane uh, was under the headquarters of the Army's Intelligence and Security Command, which was commanded by a two-star general, uh, General Burke Stubblebein. And Stubblebine was the savior of the program. At one point, Congress wanted to shut it down, shut down the funding, and then shut the program down, but wanted to shut the pro cut off the funding. I'm sorry, it wasn't Congress. It was DOD that wanted to do it. So they just essentially withheld the funds. They had that option, right? And Stubblebine said, well, I don't care if you don't pay for it. I will pay for it out of my operations funds. And so he continued to fund that program, and he continued to be a very strong supporter of it. The unfortunate thing is, as often happens with this kind of thing, <clears throat> he became too enamored of it. He kind of lost his critical thinking functions and um, started embracing anything paranormal that he came across. Uh, for, for one example, um, every time you go out and do a tour of INSCOM facilities around the world, if you ran into somebody who had some kind of paranormal interest, he tried to recruit him for the program. Of course, when the general says, you will take this person, you take that person, even if they haven't gone through your normal vetting process. And uh, so he picked some folks, probably the, the most, uh, I would say notorious, she was a nice woman, but uh, he recruited this one woman who in her spare time was a palm reader. And he thought, well, if she's a palm reader, she must be good remote viewing material. And she wasn't. <laughs> she, it was just, she, you know, we tried with her, she tried. We just, she just didn't get it. I think partly was because she, her palm reading, she, she tried to treat the rest of the, the universe like a palm to be read, you know, in a way. And, and it just wasn't compatible with the remote viewing technology that we were developing uh, and we're using. So he unfortunately also uh, pulled a couple of, oh, questionable things like so i mentioned the monroe institute and without going into a big explanation it was a a um it still is and it's great i'm you know this is nothing against the monroe institute um they work with uh acoustic frequencies established as frequency following response in your brain that actually uh is geared to try and induce out-of-body experiences sometimes it does sometimes it doesn't but it always is an interesting experience Basically, um, you listen to uh, yeah. certain audio things through a headset and you relax and try to meditate. Yes. Or it actually causes you to meditate. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it, it's, it's a really great experience and, and harmless. It's been proven to be harmless, but it also is very kind of profound a lot of times for some people and they do manage out of body. Well, he kind of fell in love with, with that process and he wanted to run the entire INSCOM staff through this, everything from colonels down to privates that are working at the INSCOM headquarters. And he succeeded in getting a few batches of people through, but he had one, the, the vetting mechanism was great. and had one lieutenant who actually had a bit of a history of, uh, of mental problems. And I won't go into too much into this because I don't want him out it or anything, right? But, but he got halfway through this experience in the Monroe Institute and just wigged out. And, uh, and they brought him back to uh, the headquarters. And the next day he was just crazy. He went running around the headquarters. There's lots, of, there's lots of stories that came out that were more sensational than what actually happened, but it was enough that it put Stubblebine on the army staff, on the senior army staff's radar as a loose gun. So um, he ended up getting forced to retire and they brought in a new general whose job was, his assignment was to clean the place up, right? And that meant also getting rid of 
of the remote viewing program. And they played the standard bureaucratic game. Well, you know, we'll, we're going to evaluate it. We're going to take briefings. We're going to figure out, but it was already foregone. We figured out later that they, he, had, he was under orders to get rid of the remote viewing program, however he had to do it. And they went through the motions, but in the end, uh, our, our commander at the time, Lieutenant Colonel Busby, Brian Busby, he's also a great guy. He was going in to get the decision. He's driving from Fort Meade over to Arlington Hall and it required going over the Anacostia River Bridge in uh, Southeast DC. And he was driving along and he, and he went over and he got the word and he came back and he prefaced his, his comments. So he, he, we had an office meeting. He said, well, I'm gonna give you the bottom line of what, uh, what General- uh, Soyster. Soyster, thank you, yes. Yeah, my brain doesn't function nearly as well as it used to, but yeah, General Soyster, uh, his decision. But first I have to tell you what happened. I was driving down and I was crossing the Anacostia River Bridge and I saw a sign up ahead that I knew was not a good sign. It said, center lane closed ahead. And Busby gets to the Pentagon. He meets with Soyster. Soyster says, we're closing down center lane. And so that was the word. And we're all going, oh, crud. Well, it was a nice time while, we're, while we had it. But there were wheels running behind the scenes. So the Defense Intelligence Agency had always had an interest in this. And one of the, I don't think he's deputy director. He's right one step under the director at DIA, Jack Verona, who is well-known uh, in essence in science and technology circles in, in the military intelligence community, very respected. He was interested in remote viewing, and he really felt like it had potential. So now, he negotiated. Just, just, just to clarify, the DIA. Yeah. So each of the different branches, like the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, yeah. they have their own um, intelligence branch. You yes. know, say Office of Special Investigations or something. Yeah. And then the Department of Defense itself, which oversees the different branches, has a supreme intelligence agency called the Defense Intelligence Agency, or DIA. Yes. yes. And I'm glad you made that uh, that clarification because a lot of people don't understand the the structure. Um, and DIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency, is separate and distinct from the CIA, which is the Central Intelligence Agency. So people kind of get confused sometimes. And of course, then there's National Security Agency, NSA, which is kind of a on the same echelon level as the Defense Intelligence Agency, but the CIA is is independent of them. So um, DIA was the one that was, that was if, via Jack Verona and, and Dale Graff, who I mentioned earlier, is now working with Jack. They negotiated with the Army to allow Center Lane to be migrated into DIA as a joint operation, uh, joint in terms of all service, although we still only had Army folks there. So for a year, we were in limbo. For a year, Center Lane had now become Dragoon Absorb, right? So the center lanes ended in, in the, at the end of December, 1984. And then in December, I'm sorry. And then from December, 1984 to the end of January, 1980, 1985 and the end of January, 1986, uh, it was called Dragoon Absorb because it was in this limbo status. We were under the operational control of DIA who was managing all the stuff we did, but we still technically belong to the army. The military does this kind of stuff all the time. Uh, just to keep things from getting too uh, boogered up, as I like to say, right? So um, on January 1st of 1986, we became officially a DIA organization, which actually allowed me to stay there a lot longer than I would have otherwise. Uh, Army officers normally only get three years in assignment at most. Often it's less than that, but at most you only get three years. I was able to stay for seven years because I had this permanent change of station, even though I never moved, right? Mm -hmm. Right in the middle of it and became, a, was assigned to a new organization, um, but doing the same thing, living in the same place, working in the same place. And it was, it was great. It was stability for my kids. Uh, shortly after that, I became a single parent and I had uh, at the time full custody. And, uh, and so they didn't have to go anywhere despite the upheaval in their family. And they're still in the same class, still the same friends and all that. So that was really good. And the program was now called Sunstreak, is that right? At this point, the name changed to Sunstreak. So Dragoon Absorb was temporary. Sunstreak now became a permanent uh, code name for the project. So on now, you mentioned the difficulty viewing the future. 
uh, in our previous episode. Mm -hmm. Um, But on Friday, May 15th in 1987, during the Sunstreak period, Mm -hmm. you had a major hit with Viewing Mm -hmm. the Future. What happened there? Well, first I want to say I am impressed with your with your homework. Oh. You really know your stuff. Well, <laughs> thank <good>. you. <laughs> yes. Um, so by this time, actually, Ed Dames had joined the unit, and so he he was at the very least entertaining <laughs> because he would oh, he was doing this, you know, we're doomed in the future thing even back then. In fact, he, I first heard this stuff back in '83 when he and I went to the Monroe Institute. So he was there. And he liked to do things because as a remote viewer, you have to be blind to the target. You can't know what the target is. So he liked to do these things where he would do what we call an open search. He'd take you over. He'd have a preconceived idea of what you're going to find in the future. And then he'd run you on this target. Okay. Well, I unfortunately disappointed him because he was looking for some kind of close encounters of the fifth kind event that he was convinced was going to happen. Right. He's famous for remote viewing aliens and Bigfoot yes. and the Loch Ness monster and stuff. Famous. What, what you've sometimes called anomaly targets. Yes. Yes. Thank you. So that was what he thought I was going to remote view. Well, instead he said, I, and I discovered later what the actual tasking was. It was something in effect of uh, describe the most, the next most important event for us to know about in the future right? In the next few days, something like that. Um, he thought it was going to be this close encounters of the fifth kind effect event. Um, I started describing a warship sailing in a closed body of water at night. I even got the smell of ga- of celery coming from the galley. It's just interesting. And then um, I'll, I'll make this relatively short. And then I perceived an aircraft off in the distance and it was orbiting around. And at some point, it drops these two cylindrical uh, objects that make a guttering sound and they have little stubby wings and they kind of fly around. And then it's like they identify this thing as their target and, and they home in on this vessel and their smoke and flame and loud noises and all kinds of stuff. And the, and the, and the vessel sags to one side and starts to lean to one side and, and all of these kind of mayhem kind of descriptions and stuff. And uh, further information I derived was that this aircraft had come from a broad sandy area near the water, but it was being controlled by this less than professional military group in a city, third world city with flat roof buildings and even some domestic animals in the streets and stuff. Um, And by the time I'm done with this, um, Ed says, because I haven't described anything you expect me to describe, right? He said, oh, okay, you're off. We're going to quit. Let's go home for the weekend, you know. So I put the session in the drawer and I go home for the weekend. And and uh, Monday morning I'm getting up. I get up. I'm getting my kids off to, to school because by this time I was a single parent, right? So I'm getting my kids off to school. And I get a phone call. And it's Skip Atwater, who was the operations officer. He said, Paul, where's that session you did on Friday? And I said, um, well, it's in my safe drawer. Why do you care I was off? And he said, you haven't seen the papers yet this morning, have you? No. So I open up my copy of the Washington Post, front page, U.S. destroyer hit by Exocet missiles fired by an Iraqi jet in the Persian Gulf. So this was the famous Stark incident. It was the Stark incident. And 50 hours before it happened, I described it. Now, the interesting thing, well, there's lots of interesting things, but um, as I'm reading the newspaper account and subsequent newspaper accounts, I realize I described this thing almost exactly. There was one anomaly anomaly that wasn't mentioned in these accounts about another multi-engine aircraft orbiting off to the side, observing all this happening. I didn't know how that fit in. A year later, I was working on my my, uh, master's of strategic intelligence degree at the Defense Intelligence College. Well, it was the Defense Intelligence College back then. Now it's the National Intelligence University, but at DIA part-time while I'm doing this other job, right? And uh, I get the after action report. I was taking an indications and warning class uh, in this degree program. And I got the action after action report of the Stark um, attack. And I'm going through this and I'm reading, it's a mirror image of, not mirror image, it's actually totally the same details and everything as my session was, obviously more detail, but still everything that I got in my session was in that, in that report. And there was nothing significant in the report that wasn't in my session, including the fact that there was a Saudi AWACS aircraft 
orbiting around, monitoring the attack as it happened. I had reported that in my session, but had never gotten any feedback on it until this point, until I read that report. So that was the best, literally the best remote viewing session I ever did. I've not done one better since. Um, it was just, and I don't know why it was, why it happened so well. I, mm -hmm. I don't know why, but and nonetheless, it was completely accurate. So yes. And on a subject that's notoriously hard to view. Yes, because it was the future. And, and that was kind of a puzzler too, because most of our other future viewings had failed. My calculation is that this was set in motion such that it was going to happen, which essentially made it a deterministic event, right? The Iraqis, of course, disclaimed any knowledge about it. They said, oh, we don't know why that pilot did that. We, we, didn't, we didn't order him to, but the suspicion is maybe they did, right? Mm -hmm. For who knows what reason, but nonetheless, uh, which means they might have started this before I did the session. So the intentionality of the event was already in play, which means it was going to happen. And so that becomes a deterministic event. Those things you can remote view to some degree better than better than others. And so, I, you know, that's a, that's a speculation. There's no way of tracing the causality on this to know exactly why. But the the uh, results are absolutely in in uh, irrefutable. In fact, you can go into the Stargate archives that the CIA released, and it is right there in the archives. The TypeScript of it is right there in the archives, mm -hmm. and so it clearly happened. Mm -hmm. Clearly happened. Now, you you mentioned Ed Dames and his interest in anomaly targets. And when people first find out about remote viewing, that's where a lot of people's minds first go. It's like, oh, I want to know about aliens, and I want to know yeah. about Bigfoot, and I want to know about Atlantis, and and all of these things. Um, what do you think about attempts to remote view those? How seriously should they be taken? Are there particular difficulties viewing those kinds of things? What's your take? <clears throat> yeah, it's a challenge. And, and unfortunately, I think it actually detracts away from progress in the remote viewing world. Because the problem with anomaly targets, as I call them, is that there's no feedback. You can remote view the heck out of it, and you'll never know whether you're right or not because you can't get ground truth on it. <clears throat> this is especially true of some people like to do these off-planet stuff, like uh, the Supreme Galactic Council. That was one of Dame, uh, Dame's favorite top targets. There's no way to get feedback on that. So you don't know if what you're reporting is just fantasy or whether there's anything real there. And we never will have feedback on it, at least within, within any kind of a reasonable time frame. So um, in a remote viewing setting, you get better as you do a remote viewing session and then get feedback to see what you did right and what you did wrong. It's standard human learning psychology. Feedback is essential to learning things in our in the way humans are made up. And if you don't have feedback, you don't learn anything, really, when you get right down to it. Um, maybe you've uncovered some mystery, but you'll never know, right? So that's probably the main reason I discourage it. But the second reason is because it distracts people from actually doing stuff that helps you learn remote viewing. It distracts you from situations where you do get feedback. You are able to improve your, your uh, process, improve your behavior. Um, so yeah, I guess that's the main reason, my main objections to it. Uh, and people tend to want to go, what's that line from Harry Potter? Uh, was it Luna who believed 13 impossible things before breakfast or something? Oh, like that. I think that's from Alice in Wonderland. Oh, maybe that's what it is. I don't remember. Oh, you know what? I think it was also in, in Harry Potter. It was borrowed. Oh, <laughs> from Alice an in homage. Wonderland. Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, at, at any rate, um, the, the, it's very, it's entertaining, but it's not remote viewing, right? People do it for entertainment. I think they get thrills by looking at these mysterious things. And, and, and it becomes really just psychic speculation, if you will, for want of a better term. One of the things that, that I've wondered about this, and I think I've seen you comment on it elsewhere, is um, the possibility of tapping into the wrong thing when this happens. So for example, let's when you're double blind as a viewer, you don't know what the target is and right. you're given a meaningless string of numbers um, and, and somehow you're subconsciously connecting that meaningless string of numbers with the intention of the person 
who who is the client who mm-hmm. assigned this task so mm-hmm. if they want you to view the eiffel tower somehow you're connecting those numbers to the eiffel tower maybe by telepathy or who knows what right and well what if the target doesn't actually exist <laughs> and they want you to view it yeah. um i could easily see uh someone in the process of acquiring the target simply picking up on the client's expectations Mm -hmm. about it let's suppose let's suppose bigfoot doesn't exist Mm -hmm. and of course we all secretly hope he does but let's suppose he doesn't (laughs) and um and your task to view bigfoot well you if if bigfoot doesn't exist then you're likely to just come up with subconsciously what your client expects to hear about Bigfoot when really there's nothing. Mm -hmm. And the problem could be even greater if there's a societal expectation. If there are a bunch of people with ideas about Bigfoot, maybe you're telepathically tapping into the cultural expectation of what people in society in general would hear about Bigfoot, but really there's nothing there because there's no hard target to view, and so you're instead just giving people what they want to hear. Do you think that's a danger? Yeah, we call that telepathic overlay, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I'm actually working on a course on remote viewing tasking, and part of the element involved, you know, I'm going to discuss is telepathic overlay, because it's a problem that has to do with intention, right? Um, Human intentionality, specific intentionality from the tasker or the the client is what drives this whole train. Um, And so if there's a target, the intentionality directs you to the target in some way, and then you're able to describe what's unknown about it. Um, If there is no target, then your, your whatever it is, your mind jumps to the next most powerful signal, which is the belief of the person that sent you that target. They believe that target exists. They believe that event happened. They believe that UFO visitation or that ET abduction or whatever happened, even though it may not ever have actually happened in that case. And you go there and, and your mind, your subconscious says, well, there's nothing here. And then it says, oh, but there's a strong signal over here. That must be what I'm supposed to do, right? You know. And so then you start reporting on what the, the tasker believes about this event and then you essentially confirm their belief because they're getting fed back what they believe but they don't realize it. they think you're bringing back real information from an event that actually never happened one thing that has occurred to me that it should be testable and i've heard that a british remote viewer named daz smith has actually tested this though i don't know the details it seems to me that it would be possible to demonstrate this effect in principle by making up a target that is known not to exist, like the giant pink glass pyramid on my lawn, when you know, in fact, you oh, don't have you look, such a one. Did well, you look recently? <laughs> it's there now, yeah. <laughs> well, it seems like it would be possible to invent such targets yeah. and then see what the results that people yes. come up with are. Yes, and and um, and Daz has actually done that. He did an experiment, made up a, fig, a, a personality in, just in his own mind, wrote it down on paper, whatever, and then targeted viewers on this, you know, using a, a what we call an encrypted coordinate, but it really is just an arbitrary string of numbers that in that that have been attached mentally to the intentionality, right? So gives them the number, they go out and they tell them all about this person that he invented. And, you know, people say, well, can you remote view Superman? Well, First of all, it depends on what you mean by that. If you mean remote view an image of Superman, yes, you can do that. If you mean remote view and a a person that we designate Superman, you can't remote view Superman because he doesn't exist, but you can remote view the tasker's belief about Superman. Mm -hmm. You pick that up. Is it remote viewing? Is it telepathy? At this point, who's going to quibble? It's it's non-local perception or or extrasensory perception or however you want to say it, right? But it serves as a caution against taking some of these more fantastic things seriously. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. So one concern, uh, to move into kind of our final set of questions, one concern that people have about uh, psychic phenomena in general, especially, you know, like people who are conservative Christians often have this Mm -hmm. concern, is that it may in some way be occult, uh, connected to occult things, And I know there was a period in the, I guess it was during the Sunstreak and Stargate period, where there was kind of an occult turn 
that happened in the program where some occult methodologies started getting introduced. And I know it raised concerns even among the viewers. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us about that? Yeah, um, one of our uh, recruits, one that actually Stubblebine also brought in, as I recall, or at least identified, uh, name was Angela. Um, and she had approached Stubblebine initially and gotten transferred Something in. like that. I, I yeah. right now don't recall exactly how she got in, but uh, Angela, Angela Ford is her last name. She'd been married in. I don't think she'll mind me identifying her because she's starting to be a little more in public. She, um, her, her, her name is also in the public record anyway. You read any right. of the books about this and it comes up. Right, right. So at the time she had her maiden name, but she she's now for Angela Ford. Um, and there was a lot of tension and strife in the unit because of this. But, um, you know, both I think some guilt on both sides due to the, about that. But um, she started off with what we call extended remote viewing, which is just a, a more of a... Uh, meditational kind of version where you try and set up a, a hypnagogic state, mind awake, body asleep, laying on a bed, and then somebody comes in and monitors, you know, interviews, asks you questions. So uh, she did that for a while, but she had learned another modality from some civilian outfit, which is, I think, what attracted Stumblebine's interest, um, which uh, was sort of a mixture of auto automatic writing and channeling. She had three or four kind of spirit guides that would inform her. She started off with scribbling and then these spirit guides would show up and they would kind of provide her information and stuff and and uh, I was um, uneasy about that not because it was a cult so much as it seemed to me assuming that these were real entities and there was a different theory that said they weren't but we won't, I won't go there I'll talk about that in a minute assuming they were real entities you have the same problem as you do as a human intelligence program uh, uh, human intelligence problem where you have a source and you don't know what their placement access and trustworthy le level of trustworthiness is. Be and normally we stay away from those kind of sources because if you can't vet them, you can't trust them, right? But in a channeling environment, you've got these presumed sources, entities there. It's even harder to vet them. How do you know what they're telling you is true? How do you know what their, what their motivations are? How do you know whether they even have access to that kind of information, could be just making it up. You know, you, you can't vet them. And so how can you trust them? Um, so that's going from the assumption that there are real entities, dis discarnate entities, right? Um, the other theory, and this is one Dale Graff came up with, is that these guys don't exist, but we're going to treat it as if they do for Angela's benefit, because that's her way of dissociating from a task that society says is impossible and permitting her subconscious to actually do this. So she blames it on these entities, these spirit entities or spirit guides or whatever. That's, that's her conscious attribution. And yet it's really just her subconscious working underneath for using them as kind of like uh, ventriloquist dummies, you know, to, to provide the information. And I, I'll tell you right now, I don't know which it is. I don't know if it's real, you know, real entities or if it's not, either one's possible. Um, but she did on occasion provide some really good information. She did solve some intelligence problems using this approach, but we were all pretty worried about it in general, the ones who weren't using W we call it, they ended up calling it WRV because that had to be some kind of RV, right? So they call it written R remote viewing, um, that the powers that be, um, and there got to be a kind of us versus them attitude in the, in the office, um, Annie Jacobson's written this book recently in which she claims it's just because the males were against the females, right? Here's a, here's a competent female remote viewer and, and the males didn't want that to happen. It's totally false because there were female remote viewers in our faction as well. Like Charlene. Right? Well, Charlene, although she was gone by then, but we, mm -hmm. you know, she was one of us. Um, Gabriella Pettengill, who was brilliant. She actually once was in the same unit as Ed Dames and had, uh, resigned her, her military commission so she could work in our office. We, we had a civilian slot. We didn't have another officer slot. She wanted to work with us. So she resigned her military commission to join us. And, but she, she was, unfortunately, was killed in the car wreck in 2002. She was brilliant. She was really good. She, I mean, she ended up, uh, after she got out of, the, out of the military service altogether, even civilian world, she went to Wharton, got her MBA, and got hired to teach capitalism to young Russian 
uh, business people in Moscow. <laughs> wow. So, yeah. So, yeah. And, uh, and she was very much the same way we were about this. And there were, there were other women who, who had misgivings about all of that stuff. So it wasn't a male versus female thing, despite what Annie has said in her book. It was literally a question about the methodology and a question about the office politics that seemed to privilege the WRV stuff and, and not and and kind of suppress the the kind of work we were doing with the with the CRV. Now, um, just to provide, and we've covered some of this in previous episodes here on Mysterious World, but the two theories that you mention are the two problems that you cite with this kind of situation. One, the idea that these entities may not be real, that they may be something that someone's coming up with subconsciously. That hypothesis actually goes back, or I'm aware of it going back to the 19th century, because as soon as the British and its American equivalent, the Society for Psychical Research, started investigating the what they called the survival hypothesis, the idea that we survive beyond death, they started talking to mediums and sometimes the mediums, the channelers of their day, would come up with really startling information, but they had a problem of how do we know this isn't just psychic powers, mm -hmm. and it's it, the person is interpreting it as spirits telling them this when really it's just their own psychic powers. So that debate goes back quite a ways. The other point you make I, I, I think is really important, even assuming they are real, mm -hmm. or especially if they're real, how do you know you can trust these guys? Mm -hmm. If you wouldn't believe a random, if an intelligence officer wouldn't believe a random source that walked in off the street and started claiming amazing knowledge with no way to check that person out, mm -hmm. why should you trust an alleged, a supposed spirit that you can check out even less? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, th what you're referring to is what's called the super psi, PSI, right? Super yes. psi hypothesis in which that, and, and, it, and it came uh, up in terms of mediumship, trans mediums, that kind of thing, where people who, who at least believed they were engaging with dead people to provide information. So it, it, there's two theories. One is they really are, really are engaging with dead people. Uh, the other theory is they just believe they're engaging with dead people, but really they're just being hyperpsychic here and being able to extract, bring information forward from the past that pertain to these people. So in that case, the identity of the dead person isn't actually the dead person, but the identity itself serves as a directive means or a queuing methodology to identify the kind of information that the medium is going to bring up, right? Into mm -hmm. for the benefit of whoever it is that's that's sitting there, right? So, um, and there's no way to tell the difference, frankly. Um, if you go strictly experientially, the medium swear it's it's exactly they're getting they're getting that from that individual who's now uh, a discarnate, you know, as a, a spirit or whatever. Um, but as we know, self-report isn't always the most reliable. In psychology, introspection and self-report are used only when they don't have better means of getting it, <laughs> because people can be fooled. They can fool themselves. Now, I'm not saying that's the case here. I don't have an opinion one way or the other on this. Um, I just know that there are these two theories and what ultimately matters is kind of like behaviorism in psychology, where in behaviorism, they treated the brain like a black box, you know, and they said, well, we can't know what's going on inside somebody's head. So we're, we're just going to, uh, maybe I should say mind, we don't know what's going on inside somebody's mind, all we know is their external behaviors, right, what they say is a behavior, how they act is a behavior, what they, you know, do or decide or choose is a behavior, we analyze those behaviors, and then we can infer what might be going on inside their heads, that's the same problem with this mediumship thing, we don't know whether it's super psi, or whether it's real entities, real real uh, past, you know, departed spirits. We don't know. Um, and so the only way you can evaluate it is the results. And of course, there's been scientific attempts to do that. Uh, Gary, um, I know his name, down at U University of Arizona, I think it's the one that's in Tucson, or is mm -hmm. it Arizona State? The University of Arizona, Gary Schwartz. Gary Schwartz has done some quite good research on mediums uh, hasn't been able to disentangle whether it's super psi or actual mediumship. But some of these folks do produce really provocative information that is confirmable. 
So what's going on? I don't know. But there does seem to be a real phenomenon there. For people who are coming from a biblical background, there's an additional challenge with this, because yes. as you know, if you read Deuteronomy uh, 18, it has some really strong warnings to the children of Israel not to engage with people who are calling up the dead. Yes. Uh, and it uses several different terms for them. Um, interestingly, uh, later on, we do see an example of this happening where King mm -hmm. Saul goes to the yes. famous Witch of Endor that yeah. inspired the character Endora on the TV show Bewitched. Was oh, that where that came from? Yeah, <laughs> she's Endora. She's the Witch I of didn't Endor. I think about that. <laughs> yeah, but uh, she, yeah. the Witch of Endor for Saul, calls up the, the, the spirit of the uh, prophet Samuel. Mm -hmm. And the way the text presents it, now some people will say, oh, this is a demon. But the way the text presents it, no, that's Samuel. And it, the text doesn't give us any indication that it's not Samuel. And in fact, in the Catholic Bible, in the Orthodox Bible, in the book of Sirach, it confirms it was Samuel. Mm. Um, uh, so coming from those perspectives, there's evidence that actually sometimes you could contact the spirits of the deceased. God may allow that. It's just not something that's, uh, that's permitted. Yeah, and I think the issue is, of course, where you, uh, so so in, in the LDS church, authority is important, right? Yeah. You have to uh, feel, you have to not just feel that you have authority, but it has to actually be certifiable. You have authority from God to do things, right? And and one of the problems with these ancillary sources of information and, and uh, other than what you normally get through empirical means or from normal perception is that they seem to be an alternate alternate channel to the authoritative channels that God provides, such as prophets, right? Um, they they're competitors in a way, and they're ones that the worry is that that uh, Satan, for those who believe he exists, which I do, that Satan can exploit, right? As an alternative, Satan's always trying to counterfeit, right? Um, uh, counterfeit the things that God does in in a legitimate way. So um, I don't know if Satan's counter, you know, exploiting these things. I, I don't know. That's outside my wheelhouse. But, but nonetheless, it's plausible from a religious perspective. It's something, you know, one reasonably ought to worry about, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that that's the issue. It isn't that they're not real. It's that, that they could present, present a danger to mislead people. Mm -hmm. I think that's the idea. And go ahead. One of the... So one of the things that I try to do here on Mysterious World is consider the range of possible explanations uh -huh. for phenomena and then follow the evidence yeah. and see where it goes. So in terms of of things like remote viewing, setting aside the written remote viewing, the automatic writing stuff that involves alleged discarnate spirits, but just yeah. talking about the CRV methodology right. that Ingo uh, developed, that presents itself as... A, as a natural human ability, whether it's in the mm -hmm. body or the mind or the spirit, whatever, it's rooted in human nature. Right. So it appears to be a natural ability rather than something involving other spirits. Now, f in the Catholic tradition, there are theologians like St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas who were quite prepared to acknowledge that humans have weak natural abilities that today we would uh, call psychic. Uh, they had uh, equivalents to telekinesis. They didn't call it that because te the terms telekinesis and psychokinesis mm -hmm. hadn't been invented yet. Also, right. they had equivalents to precognition, which St. Thomas Aquinas called natural prophecy mm -hmm. to distinguish it from the supernatural prophecy that God gives. Mm -hmm. And so they would acknowledge, okay, humans may have these weak natural abilities that we would call psychic. Mm -hmm. They also acknowledge, though, that demons could produce Exploit some them. of the same effects. Right. Based on your experience, and you've had, you know, more than 20, more than 30 years now, mm -hmm. uh, uh, almost 40 of experience with remote viewing, what's, based on your assessment of the evidence in your experience, do you think this is a natural human ability, or is it something that's being caused by demons, or could it be something else? Okay. So first thing I'm going to say is a natural human ability. But to explain that, I want to go back a little bit again. So what I was explaining about the way these 
in the Bible, particularly these that are described in the Bible, could be used as a way to circumvent, you know, the channels that God normally uses and people could exploit. Explain that as a reason why people worry about this, right? Worry about this in terms of, of religion. Um, and the fact is that's a possibility, but it's interesting that in the Bible, for the most part, I don't think there's exceptions. It's been a while since I've uh, gone through all this, but um, for the most part, we're talking about what the King James calls soothsaying, right? And essentially, we're talking about necromancy or mediumship when you get right down to it, right? So that's what the Bible is mostly worried about, that kind of thing. And of course, because that would seem like if demons or whatever are going to be involved in the process, that is a likely ingress, a likely place way they could get involved, right? So <clears throat> I'm going to set that aside. There are other modalities, and there's a book called ESP in the Bible. It was written a long time ago. Uh, I think you can get it still in used copies. I don't know if there's new copies anymore. ESP in the Bible, which talks about parallels in the Bible uh, that parallel different kinds of ESP experiences. And most of them are not essentially condemned. They're just reported matter-of-factly. For example, uh, when David consults the ephod to find out where the, the armies of the Philistines are, right? If I'm remembering the story, it's like I said, been a few years, but I think that's, that's how it unfolds. That's really very much like a scrying event. Scrying is, you know, the classic squire is the gypsy with the crystal ball telling you stuff, you know, but but there's it's a far broader topic than just that. And David uses the ephod almost like a scrying implement to obtain information that he needed uh, in his ongoing fight, right, with mm -hmm. these guys, right? Um, you're familiar yeah. with the story, right? Yeah, and the yeah. ephod is, it was possessed by the high priest, yes. and it was one of the authorized methods for inquiring of God, yes. rather than one of the unauthorized methods. Right. And which, point which out, to my mind, is the essential difference between religious ritual and magic. Magic is okay. the unauthorized <laughs> stuff, religious ritual is the authorized that's, stuff. That's actually quite a good distinction there, yes. I would agree with it, in fact. But the interesting thing here is David himself wasn't the high priest. So technically he wasn't authorized, but this suited what God needed done, right? And so he was willing to allow that. Um, some of the things that, that happened in the New Testament, for example, the woman at the well, when Jesus says, she says, I have no husband. He says, you're right. The guy you're living with isn't your husband, right? She goes, how did he know that, <laughs> right? Well, this that's another example of what we would call ESP, although obviously, Jesus had capabilities and capacities far beyond what we do, right? Yeah. So, but there's lots of similar instances here and there throughout the Bible, and uh, and and uh, it indicates that maybe there's there's a little more latitude than a lot of people think about this stuff. Now, to go back to your Aquinas and Augustine, um, this is from my own Mormon theological background, but I am convinced that these are spiritual abilities. Now, Mormonism, uh, it's a little fuzzy, but to some degree, we uh, more than other Christian denominations, we tend to uh, allow, so, so and, and I realize I'm trying to be careful here, I don't want to misstate here, but in, in uh, generally in amongst the Christian denominations, there's this there's this perception, at least, that you're either influenced by Satan or God, and that's it. Either you go with what God wants you to do, or you go with what Satan wants you to do, um, and, and that's it. Um, Mormonism gives us third force in there. It's actually multiple third forces, and that's each one of us. Um, we, we believe that a person can make bad choices without being influenced by Satan, they make good choices without being influenced by God, because we are, as it says uh, in one of our scriptures, uh, agents unto ourselves. Now, the goal is to make good choices on your own account and by being influenced by God, allowing God's influence into your life, and not do the opposite. But nonetheless, we do have autonomy uh, to a certain degree, much less than God's or probably Satan's. But still, if we have this autonomy, that we can make choices based just on our own recognizance, if you will. Now, Mormon is also, oh, go ahead. You well, I was just going to say, uh, from a Catholic point of view, we'd say something similar. Um, God has given mankind free will, and yeah. so that gift comes from God, but yeah. then there's liberty to use it. Now, you're not mm -hmm. supposed to use it to choose evil, 
but right. you can use it to choose among different goods and build right. something good in the world on that basis. So there's a similar right. convergence of perspectives there. So here's an interesting thing before I get back to what I was saying. At Fort Meade, the people who religiously were able to deal with this the best were the Mormons and the Catholics. Mm. And I think that's because we had a context that made this understandable. Um, we had Protestants there and and almost exclusively, I can't think of an example where it wasn't the case, one example, and she left the program because she could not deal with it, right? Mm -hmm. But in most other cases, the guys who were Protestants tended to lose their faith mm. in this because they didn't have a context to fit it in. Now, I think there probably is a Protestant case to be made for it, but they were not able to make that case. So are you saying they lost their Protestant faith or they lost their faith in RV? They lost their faith in, in their Protestant faith. Okay. Yeah, they pretty much kind of went off the new age, drank the new age Kool-Aid, right? Mm -hmm. Where, you know, there's just the forces in the universe. There's not a specific God, at least in the way that Christianity conceives of it, that kind of thing, right? That's kind of the direction they went. Um, uh, but the Mormons and Catholics, they, they tended to actually, in a way, be strengthened by this. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, of course, because we do have a context for it. So... And again, that's not put Protestants down because I think no. you could make a case in Protestantism to support this stuff as well, carefully, right? Um, but they were just were not able to connect those dots. And you know, I I didn't I've learned way more about religion since then. So I I, I might have been able to help them back then <laughs> if I had known what I know knew then now then, right? So anyway, uh, Mormonism is also a little bit uh, I might even say bizarre in that we believe that. Uh, that what we are innately, you know, our identities existed before we became physical beings. So we call this pre-existence. I think you're probably familiar with the, oh, yeah. the Mormon concept. Yeah. You know, believe in pre-existence that we as spirit entities existed before, still as children of God. We're spirit children of God, and uh, we live collectively with God. And back then, we were, when we were in this pre-existence, we could communicate, we could apparently move around, we could uh, know things, all that stuff. But remember, we're doing all this before we even have a physical body, right? So what does that sound like? It sounds an awful lot like ESP. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? oh, so I would make yeah. the same the same point. It sounds like even though Catholics don't believe in the pre-existence of souls, yeah. we believe in the post-existence. Yes. So souls in purgatory or heaven, well, how mm -hmm. are they talking and knowing and relating? And yes. angels who are uncreated intellects from the Catholic perspective, or mm -hmm. created intellects from the Catholic perspective, if angels are talking to each other and fighting and stuff like that, that sounds a lot like telepathy and yeah. psychokinesis. Yeah, which is an interesting insight I had not thought about, so I really appreciate you uh, you introducing that uh, to me. Yeah. Um, but essentially, to, to maybe cut this down a little bit, uh, when we then become incarnate, if you will, <laughs> to use the term, we, we receive our bodies when we're born, um, the spirit and the body together form the human soul. That's how we interpret it. But nowhere, we, we forget the pre-existence. That's part of the condition of being here. Uh, it's a bit of a test as well as a learning experience. So we can't know the answers before we get here, right? Or after we get here. Um, so, but it doesn't say anywhere we lose those spiritual abilities that we have as spirits. And so what I think is happening, my personal interpretation, and it actually kind of fits in with what you just said even, is that what we're doing, uh, one of the missions that we're assigned while we're here is to learn how to bring our physical bodies into subjection of our spirit spirits, right? And we do it through a glass darkly, as Paul said, right? And we, it's a tough thing, but I mean, that's part of learning is that you got to do the tough stuff as well. But it doesn't say we've lost those spiritual abilities. So what I think what we're doing is part of what we're doing here is we are supposed to also learn how to integrate those abilities into our physical lives as well. And so when we are learning remote viewing, we're essentially remembering what we used to be able to do without any obstruction in, as spirits. And now we have the body as this filter that gets in the way, and we're trying to learn how to do it uh, despite that additional layer, right? So anyway, that, that's how I treat all this stuff, which is, I think, one of the reasons why Mormons are pretty congenial with it. We do believe in personal revelation, and this is kind of like personal revelation, even if, you know, talking about a Soviet weapon system isn't necessarily a revelation from God, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it could be. I mean, if God cared whether 
we knew about that. Maybe God helps us do that, right? But but nonetheless, it isn't necessarily direct revelation from God in any sense. It's it's us exercising the underlying faculties that we have innately as human beings. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Paul. It's been a very stimulating discussion, and it's been one that uh, has gotten us both into some theoretical questions as well as knowledge of a part of U.S. history that has remained hidden from a lot of people. So really want to thank you uh, for being our guest today. And hopefully maybe we can uh, chat some more at some point in the future. Sure. I always let you can tell I like to talk. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. You bet. Excellent. So Jimmy, what's your bottom line uh, here on Paul Smith and remote viewing? The Stargate program is a fascinating subject, and I'm really glad that we were able to talk with someone who was there on the ground and took part in it when it was happening. Remote viewing, whether you believe it's a real phenomenon or not, is also a fascinating subject. And I want to thank Paul Smith for taking the time to tell us about both the Stargate program itself and to look at remote viewing with me from the perspectives of faith and reason. Excellent. So, Jimmy, what further resources can we offer the listener and viewer We'll have a link to Paul Smith's book, The Essential Guide to Remote Viewing, which is written for a wide audience, including people who don't know anything about RV. Uh, in fact, it's designed for people who study or practice RV to give to their skeptical friends and family to help them understand it. As you'd expect from Paul, he avoids the hype and sensationalism that often surrounds the paranormal and provides an introduction to the science and practice behind remote viewing. We'll also have a link to his book, Reading the Enemy's Mm. Reading the Enemy's Mind, which is uh, the definitive history of the Stargate program, and I really recommend that. We'll also have a link to Annie Jacobson's book, Phenomena. Uh, we'll have links to Paul Smith's blog, an article about the Stargate program, uh, to my YouTube channel, and also to some previous episodes of Mysterious World, uh, episodes uh, 102 and 103 on remote viewing, episodes 105 and 106 on Aquinas and the Occult, episode 79 on religion, magic, psychic phenomena, and science, and episode 137 on mediums. We'll also have a link to an article I wrote on St. Thomas Aquinas and the Occult, uh, where we have an algorithm that expresses the principles that Aquinas used to evaluate paranormal phenomena. So you could run remote viewing through that uh, algorithm and guesstimate, because we can't enter, ask him directly, but you could estimate uh, what St. Thomas Aquinas would have to say about it. We'll also have links to uh, the USS Stark incident that uh, Paul Smith remote viewed, and we'll have a link to his original uh, write-up and typescript of that incident, which he was kind enough to put on his own website uh, specifically for our listeners. So he went to some extra effort to do that. I really want to thank him for doing that. We'll also have uh, links to Gary Schwartz, the parapsychologist he mentioned that has done research on contact with the dead. We'll have information about the Beka Valley and the Lebanese hostage crisis. Also, uh, General Albert, Stubble, Albert Stubblebine, uh, the Super Psi Hypothesis. Like last episode, we'll have a link to a video where the British remote viewer Daz Smith demonstrates the first three stages of controlled remote viewing. Like, like we said, he was doing that for people who are interested in maybe learning it. But even if you're not interested in learning it, it's fascinating to see how it actually works. So I'll have it queued up to that point in the video. Also, I uh, want to thank uh, Daz for uh, sending me a link. I reached out to him and asked, hey, can you uh, help me with this research you did on remote viewing targets that don't exist. And he'd actually written about that before, so we'll have a link to his article about that. It includes not only the experiment he did, but some other situations as well uh, that were similar. We'll have some links to uh, passages in the Bible that Paul and I were talking about. One is in Deuteronomy 18, where it talks about uh, contacting the dead. We'll also have a link to 1 Samuel 28, which is the Witch of Endor story, and also the passage in the book of Sirach that confirms, yeah, that was Samuel. So you can click on those links and read those Bible passages. Excellent. Very good.
Uh, so, Jimmy, what do we have for mysterious headlines this week? Well, lots of people into remote viewing are curious about aliens. And uh, regardless of the difficulties in using remote viewing to find out about aliens, uh, hopefully we'll be able to find out through some other means. And so we'll have, a, a, in addition uh, or in place of remote viewing, um, we'll have a link to an article about a new telescope. This is another James Webb telescope that is going to be much more accurate and has much higher resolution and will be looking for life signatures on exoplanets. So, you know, we've been able to study the chemistry of some other planets and their atmospheres. And there are things you could find in the atmosphere that would indicate, hey, there's life here. I mean, if you were in a distant solar system looking at Earth through a telescope, you could tell by the chemistry of our atmosphere that we have life. And so now we're gonna try to do the same thing. We're gonna be looking for life signatures on exoplanets. Also, uh, in addition to studying aliens at a distance, um, we might have the opportunity to study it up close because there are all those UAPs, Unidentified Aerial Phenomena, otherwise known as UFOs, that the Navy and other military groups have been encountering. And we've reported in previous episodes of Mysterious World on the, um, on the Defense Department's efforts to figure out what's going on there, whether it's terrestrial or non-terrestrial, either way, it's significant. And f former Senator Harry Reid of Nevada is urging the creation of a permanent UFO program to study this. He, so he takes it very seriously, and we'll have a link to where you can uh, read about that and watch an interview with him. Great. All right, that about does it for us this time. We want to hear from you. What are your thoughts about our conversation with Paul Smith? You can let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akins Mysterious World Facebook page, sending us an email to mysterious at sqpn.com or sending a tweet to at mys underscore world. And uh, Jimmy, what are we going to be talking about next time? Next week, we'll be answering questions from our patrons, and this time we'll be discussing subjects like will faster than light travel ever happen? What did I do back when I was a detective? Uh, why do we experience emotional crying? What function does that play? Could the Eye of the Sahara be Atlantis? We'll be talking about Nazi UFOs, communication with the dead, the Shroud of Turin, and the implications of God's timelessness for deja vu and clairvoyance. Excellent. Folks, remember to follow Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, your favorite podcast app, or at our YouTube channels, the Jimmy Akin's YouTube channel, or the SQPN YouTube channel, where you should also make sure to hit that bell to get notifications. You can find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion and links to those mysterious headlines on our show notes at sqpn.com slash mysterious. And remember, to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest. <laughs>